Uh, we've all just finished lunch, so keep this in context with that, and I'm sure we're all safe. But food safety is serious. I mean, it, it can have a huge impact across an industry when it happens in just a small operation. And in what is becoming an all too frequent event, nearly every week we hear about a new outbreak, um, sometimes involving hundreds, um, in some cases thousands of individuals. In most of these cases, the food manufacturers lack knowledge about how to prevent the growth of a bacterial pathogen on their food product. Let's look at a few examples. In July of last year, we began learning about cases of listeriosis, a disease caused by a bacterium named Listeria monocytogenes. The illnesses were severe and associated with a ready-to-eat product called Poloni. Today, it's estimated that more than 1,000 South Africans suffered from this infection and that 210 of them, which we know died, suffered a severe illness typically within a week of consuming the product. And now when we look back on this epidemic, it's recognized as the largest outbreak of listeriosis in the history of epidemiology of this disease. And more local, in February, Another listeria outbreak was linked to rock melons grown in New South Wales with at least 19 confirmed cases and six deaths, and possibly even more infections in nine other countries where this product was also exported. In April, 70 cases of salmonellosis were linked to pre-cut melons distributed by major food stores in the U.S., including Costco's, Walmart, and uh, Whole Foods, which was recently acquired by Amazon. And in the same month, E. coli caused at least 200 illnesses and five deaths in 35 U.S. states from eating romaine lettuce. Perhaps equally disturbing, and these go back more years than the ones that I just described, are these unusual scenarios that we hear about, which we didn't think about, you know, five years ago, or maybe even sooner, such as salmonella in peanut butter, salmonella in chocolate, in cereals, cake mixes like, like uh, cookie dough, and even pet food, which cross-contaminates children sometimes when the, the pet's being fed this food. So why are these outbreaks occurring and how can we prevent them? A common denominator in all of these outbreaks is a lack of knowledge by the food manufacturers about how the pathogens grew in their food. Did that information exist? In most cases, it did. Then why wasn't it used? And typically, the answer is because that information was buried in a journal article and not in a format that could be easily accessed and used by the food manufacturer. And there are also other contributing factors, one of which is the enormous size and speed of modern food chains. So this is going through a series of years showing major trading ports and the, and the size of the nodes represent, uh, are related to the amount of product brought through those particular nodes in countries. Just consider this food, Chicken Kiev, which can be made up of 10 different ingredients or sorry, uh, all originating from different countries. So incredibly complex food chains compared to what we had not too long ago. So what we need is to help the food, to help manage the food chains and improve food safety is to better manage the flow of information, plus integrate into that information predictive tools, as I described, out of journal publications that food companies can use to answer the question, what if I did this? What if the temperature increased during shipment? What could be the impact on consumers that eat a food that will not be cooked? What would have happened if we treated the rock melons on the surface of the rock melon on the farm in a particular way before it was shipped? And we can answer many of these questions with predictive models as our center has been doing for quite a few years. An, unex an expected response to food outbreaks is to, is to apply a new food regulation. So it happens, we weren't aware of the scenario, so we say, okay, we need a new food regulation. 
However, even government experts recognize that we have insufficient tools to help guide food processors. We may have some information at different nodes in the supply chain, but we don't have comprehensive models that can help them understand when they do something at this point in the supply chain, how does that translate down to the c consumer? Many of us know about the HACCP food safety systems that you see here and the numerous risk assessments that have been conducted, particularly by the World Health Organization, the Food Agriculture Organization, millions of dollars spent on risk assessments. However, very few of these risk assessments have ever been translated into easy tools that can be implemented by small and medium enterprises. In 2010, the U.S. introduced the Food Safety Modernization Act, which placed even more responsibility on food producers to manufacture safe food but importantly, this had to be done with documented science-based information in the development of preventive controls. And this type of system is certainly driving the uh, food manufacturing industry in the US. And so this is where I think the story comes back to researchers who I believe have the responsibility to help our stakeholders meet these challenges. And one important way that we can do this is by translating our science from this kind of confusing language in our publications, and I'm picking on predictive microbiology, to something that they can better understand, a simple interface that takes all of that complexity and translates it into an interface where they can input the information and see some easy outputs so they can understand how their food processes affect these organisms. And so what I'd like to do is to share with you a case about a new product that we've produced at the university in TIA that's called CB Premium. It's a toolbox of predictive models that we believe will help Tasmanian national and international food companies design effective food safety systems that result in safer foods. CB Premium would not have been, would not have been produced without the contributions from a lot of talented people across the university. And many of you are here, including in strategic planning, business development, commercialization, finance, professional staff, researchers, and many others in the school, in the faculty, and in various UTAS departments. So it truly was interdisciplinary, way outside of sciences, including lots of key individuals to make a product that could be commercialized could, and that could be sustainable. And many of the TIA staff here who process invoices, um, we certainly appreciate you helping us do that so we could get the product out as soon as we could. So who are our customers? Obviously, they're the food producers. They're the food processors. They're also government risk managers who develop regulations into policy or regulations and policies to help guide the safe production of food as well as students and researchers. And I'll talk about some of the incentives with the latter in a moment. To achieve the goal, we developed a business case that was based on an assumption that the product would be sustainable. And by that, we mean you have to pay for the product. Very modest. Once a month, you pay a fee. Maybe a nice uh, cappuccino would, would give you complete access to all of the models that we have in the system. We also have four free models that we consider to be those kinds of models that we want everyone to have access to because they're quite generic in, in the ways that they encompass food safety. We also want to leverage new opportunities from CB Premium, and we want to provide clear incentives for the users to access the models so that we have tools built into this system that allow them to print out reports which they need to use to document the design and validation of their food systems, as well as to provide incentives to researchers. So one of the things we do is if we use your model, you get a free lifelong subscription to CB Premium. And also we provide you with metrics so you can report how many people have accessed my model and downloaded it or used it to make a food safety calculation. So we think that's also important so that researchers can d document some aspect of the impact of their research. So I encourage you to visit the site at cbpremium.org. There's not enough time today, obviously, to go through the site and show you all the features. 
Our programmer, Daniel Marin, based out of Madrid, Spain, did an excellent job of building this interface. He's also the programmer for our other product called Combase. Um, that again, I'm not going to go into detail about today. We have a YouTube channel that provides users with background information about how to use the models and an overview of the product. Just some screenshots. So I know this doesn't do any justice to what it looks like, but um, we have a simple menu here. Um, basically, we've got currently about 35 models. You just type in keywords here and it filters all of the models and brings them up to you. And then once you get inside of the model, and we think this is a key, uh, key value of CB Premium, is that we have a uniform interface. As you go from one model to the next, unlike some of the other models we find out on the internet where you have to learn a new interface each time, here you're accustomed to where you put the inputs and how to achieve the outputs, how to produce a report by clicking the print, how to find more details about the model by clicking here, because behind it is information from the publication uh, that allows you to have that documentation. This is just a snapshot of the Risk Ranger tool. It's a very, very popular tool used by people around the world currently. Um, and for quite a few years, actually, we had it in an Excel format, which was fairly clunky. And now it's nice and smooth. We don't have version control issues where people download an Excel file and you're not sure if it was an old one or a new one. Uh, now it's all here. And if it's updated, they have one source to get that information. So where are we, where are we today? Um, as I said, I'm not discussing Combase. Combase is a product, we, um, another web portal of information or about food safety and how organisms grow. We have 50,000 registered users in Combase, and that has been a major advantage by having that historic development of, a, of, a, um, of an audience. So when we want to market and target uh, CB Premium, we have a, a captured audience that obviously is going to be interested in more models that can help them manage food. Combase is more focused on researchers, whereas CB Premium targets food industries. In three weeks since we launched CB Premium, we've had, we have now 300 registered users that are taking part in a one month free trial. And we expect that to grow, uh, you know, several thousand, hopefully a year, like we saw with Combase. Next week, we're launching a social media campaign primarily through LinkedIn, which has the highest concentration and the easiest way to target food professionals. Uh, we also have um, some researchers, for, such as at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, who have already targeted CB Premium as a place they want their model to be when their publication comes out. So it's now part of their actual research plan in the U.S., in the FDA at least, and we hope that will increase with more researchers that see this as an accompanying way of having their information available. Um, on the 8th through the 10th of July, where we have an exhibit booth at the Peak Food Safety Conference, the International Association of Food Protection in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, some in the audience will also be there helping us with our first, what we call hard launch of the product. We have 4,000 food safety professionals that we hope are going to come by the booth and learn more about uh, CB Premium as well as Combase. We've, I also want to mention that we've formed a data acquisition team. Uh, this, the way that this works is we hear about an outbreak, we find the publication, we get the model, and then that is available. We have rock melon models available within a few weeks of the outbreak. We've done the same thing with romaine lettuce. We find the articles, we contact the authors and get the models available as soon as we can. To do that, we have a team of three part-time people um, two of them are UTAS Master of Science graduates. Uh, we have Anchana Dillip, who works out of the UK. We have April Liu, who works here out of Hobart. And our new PhD student in, uh, in our center, Deepan Sakar, in the back of the room. Deepan is also helping us with data acquisition. So where are we going from here? We want to organize workshops to be delivered here in Tasmania as well as you know, various places where users may have interest in learning more about the details of operating the models. We know that there's opportunities to expand CB Premium not just in models but in associated food safety training, certification. We know, for example, with Combase that we have universities utilizing that 
all the time in their food science courses. So we think CB Premium will also be a very good teaching tool, and hopefully it will also generate some consul uh, consultations and new research projects. And we're currently exploring a partnership um, through contacts uh, through TIA, through Hoger's uh, involvement in several organizations with Tufts University as part of their USAID Feed the Future Nutrition Laboratory, where models such as this can have a major impact in reducing food waste as well as preventing illness. We're also uh, working with Driscoll's to integrate these types of models into their berry supply chains. Coca-Cola sees this as important to help them in new product development. And finally, Walmart and IBM are they're currently identifying a demonstration supply chain to integrate our models into their into sensors uh, as part of their blockchain technology. And with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention. I hope to interact with you if you have any questions about this exciting product.